Welcome to another episode of the Gay Bar Archive Show, where we explore gay history one bar at a time. I'm your host, Art Smith, and our special guest today started his performing career at a very early age, impersonating the look and the sound of such gay icons as Bette Midler, Barbara Streisand, and Cher. Forty years later, he's still at it. Please welcome Eddie Edwards. Welcome, Eddie. Thank you very much. It is great to be here, Art. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, you're quite welcome. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yes, me too. I think this is going to be a lot of fun uh, down memory lane. <laughs> it, it has been for me so far. Um, as you know, my Gay Bar Archives project is all about exploring the history of gay bars and the role they played in the growth of our community. Um, why do you think that's important to remember that part of our past? Oh, man. Well, because it is basically the um, LGBT uh, transgender community. If I miss something, you know, uh, forgive me. But um, I think um, in a lot of cases, uh, for a lot of people, um, that was basically our family when we actually um, were coming out of the closet, when we were confused, when we had all the mumbo jumbo going on in our brains about, you know, all the craziness that society basically gives us, um, all this trash, um, the, uh, the gay bars were uh, very important to me and so many other people. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's kind of changed a lot over the years, but yet the foundation is still there in the fact where it's just a great community, really, um, family. Um, and I think it's something that needs to be always remembered um, and something that needs to be, you know, um, always there for um, us as a gay community um, to be able to have. I agree 100%. Um, now, you started performing in gay bars at a very early age in the early 80s. Some accounts claim that you knew that you were gay by that time. What was that experience like for a teenager? Well, I'll tell you, um, I knew I was gay probably even before I hit puberty. Uh, I know that's really weird uh, for a lot of people to understand, maybe not, but um, I really knew that I was gay. And um, I think the only thing that kind of held me back from kind of accepting it, um, you know, at the age of like, you know, 12, uh, 13 was basically my influence that I had with the uh, religion that I grew up with, which was uh, Pentecostal. Um, you know, Southern Baptist. Uh, and um, that kind of lasted for a little bit. But then as I educated myself about it, I realized that it was just, you know, a bunch of hullabaloo, you know, a lot of, you know, craziness that uh, is based on fear. And of course, you know, um, just other people's b belief. But I just kind of, um, you know, decided I wasn't going to live a lie and I was just going to basically let the world know who it was that I was. And if they decided to accept me, that's great. If not, that's their issue, not mine. I mean, I, I had came to terms with it. So I actually, you know, told my, you know, I told my, I, I told several people, I didn't tell my dad um, I told my mom, I told other friends of mine that uh, were gay, that, you know, I was gay. And then uh, when I was a sophomore in high school, um, I came out of the closet. Now, this was a very redneck uh, high school. It was Tucson, Arizona, back in the uh, 1980. Um, and uh, it was really redneck. And I just thought, you know what, this is who I am. Um, this is, you know, um, I'm not, I'm not going to live a lie. I think that's probably was the most important thing is I didn't want to live a lie in who it was 
that I was as a person. Well, it's funny because, you know, I'm glad that I actually did that because I get letters and emails from a lot of people that I went to high school with who said that I was really kind of their, their hero in a way because um, as they, you know, came to their uh, sexuality, um, you know, and learned who it was that they were, I was an inspiration to them, which was, you know, kind of weird for me. But uh, a lot of these people were people that I got bullied by. But anyways, um, you know, that was the reason why I decided to come out of the closet when I was really young, because I just, you know, I just didn't want to live a lie. Now you have a, a somewhat unique experience because you started before you were professionally performing, you started performing at home with your identical twin brother and your yes. parents and your twin brother were aware that you were gay, obviously, since you came out to them. Uh, what was their reaction? Well, I think my brother was the one who took it the most difficult. And the reason why is because, you know, when you're a twin, you are really judged as the same person. You don't have your own identity. So um, it was really hard, I think, for him. Um, but, you know, in another way, um, as time went on, it was an inspiration for um, him because later on, you know, during the, um, you know, his life, he did come, come to terms that he was gay, but he just didn't want to live the gay lifestyle, which was absolutely fine. I mean, again, I have no judgment about that. You know, if someone want, doesn't want to live the, uh, the life of being gay, that is their decision. So um, he, that's the way he's always been. Um, I would say from the age of 20, uh, on, he decided that he wanted to become asexual just because of our careers. Um, and he just did not have the time to be able to focus on that part of his life. So he's kind of just put everything into business. And I respect that. I appreciate that. And in all honesty, it was good for me because I didn't want to run the business part of uh, show business. But um, a lot of his friends that were gay looked up to me. Um, and, um, I think that, um, you know, it, it was, it, it was tough, but we, when we, when we played as kids, I was always the woman and he was always the man. So I think that, you know, in a sense, kind of deep down, you know, he kind of knew that this was the journey that I was going to take in life. And I will say that when we started working together, it, it was really a major issue for a very long time, just because my brother is a, a devout born again Christian now. Um, but yet I say that in a way where he's very open uh, to gay people and all that stuff. He doesn't have a judgment towards any of that, those people now. He did it earlier in his life, uh, 20 years ago, but I think the journey that I have taken in my life um, has really helped him look at the whole gay thing uh, completely differently. I can understand that. And I totally agree with your philosophy as well as his, that um, while it is heartwarming to hear about some celebrity or person that you admire and respect coming out as being gay. And that does kind of bring a sense of pride to the, you know, to gay people. In reality, I don't care who anybody is sleeping with unless I'm sleeping with them. Then that, that might be an issue, but That's right. That's right. in general, it doesn't matter to me who other people choose to sleep with. That's their business. Yes. 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 I agree. So you have performed all over the world. You've performed in Asia, Japan, Japan, China, Singapore, Singapore. Um, you performed in Puerto Rico, the Bahamas, all kinds of different places. Mm -hmm. And several of these were gay venues. Yes. Um, do you remember the names of these 
these gay bars where you performed early in your career and you have memories about them? Oh, you want God, to yes. yes, I do. And being, being someone who was young, um, you know, not that I'm young now, but younger, you know, I was in my twenties, uh, and thirties when I was, uh, you know, traveling to these places, it was so amazing for a young gay man to be able to experience the, the, the gay bars and, um, all of the things that were kind of different, but yet the same, uh, from America to let's say Japan or, um, you know, China or, um, you know, uh, Puerto Rico or different things, you know, like that, um, you know, a lot of it was the same, but yet a lot of it was different. I think the common denominator is that they were all the same, but yet it was interesting because in some countries that I were, female impersonators were like gods. You know, at, they, they were they were just amazing because people just looked up to them because they were just amazed by what it is that they you know did. So you know, it's kind of like you know the uh, the lady boys in Thailand. Uh, they are, you know, like goddesses over there and it's very popular and, you know, uh, you know, it, they were not looked down upon like we were looked on down upon in the 70s and 80s where we were just drag queens, you know, um, and different things like that. Over there, it was considered to be an art form. Um, it was these these um, these drag queens were kind of worshipped, you know, in their own community, and um, you know uh, their their art form of performing was you know amazing things that I had never seen uh, before. Uh, it's amazing the imagination, um, all of the different um, things that uh, you know that they did over there that I had never seen as a gay man over here. You know, when I grew up, um, lookalikes were basically um, th the thing. If you didn't do a lookalike and you were um, a drag queen, um, you weren't really anything, you know. It's not like now where, like with the, with the RuPaul drag race people are, they said they had their own image, they had their own thing. Uh, back when I was in the 80s, you know, um, it was different. You kind of had to do a lookalike um, to be able to be kind of, you know, uh, big. I'm not saying that there were not uh, people that had their own personas, but um, everyone that I, that I worked at had their own uh, celebrity that they actually did. So, um, like I said, um, uh, I, um, in uh, Japan, a uh, wonderful bar, bar called The Kinsman. I don't know if it's still there. It was wonderful. We did performing there. Um, and then um, Singapore, there was a place called Dorothy's, um, which was owned by uh, two of my very dear friends. Um, I know they had like shows and different things over there. Um, then in, in, then in Puerto Rico, we did an amazing place. We did this a lot. It was called the Atlantic Beach Hotel. It was the gay, um, a gay hotel, gay bar that was on the water. And um, they had an amazing outdoor area right on the beach. And uh, so when you were out there, you know, you had the wonderful mist of the ocean and the, the wind that was hitting you and your hair and it was just blowing just right and whatever. And it was kind of like, you know, Diana Ross when she was in Central Park, you know, with the hair and all this stuff or whatever. And uh, we had, you know, um, amazing, amazing times over there. Um, it's interesting. I don't remember the gay bar in the Bahamas, but there were a couple of them that I performed at when I was over there, which was, you know, uh, really, you know, that was, that was really a great ex experience. They really, and you have to realize, you know, over in the Bahamas, it's very conservative. So um, that was really underground. It was kind of an underground club because, you know, the Bahama people didn't really look at um, gay people as, you know, um, accepting. Um, China, exact same way. It was all underground. Um, I don't remember the bar over there that I performed at, but it was, um, there were a, a couple of them and man, it was packed. It was packed and they, they gave money like it was 
going out of town, you know, that, and then also Japan was the same way. Um, they would tip you a uh, hundred yen, which I believe at that time was about a hundred dollars. So, um, you know, they, you really made a lot of money when, when you went over there. Um, and then also Amsterdam as well. I performed over in Amsterdam at several different places. One, I think was called the cock ring. Um, I believe I'm not sure about that, but I, I, I it seems to be, um, uh, I performed there and I performed a couple other places and he, and again, um, the, it was amazing. They really worshiped, um, you know, celebrity impersonators, drag queens over there. And it was just, you know, it was really amazing how like over there at that particular time, it was just so open and everyone just let everyone be who they were. And it was amazing. And, you know, the bathhouses over there are completely different than the bathhouses were here in the eighties, where it was kind of like a hush hush thing over there they're celebrated over there. They have, they had two different ones. One was a day spa and it was a place where you would go and you would relax and you would have your massage and you would, you know, all that stuff. And it was like a, a luxury thing or whatever. And then you would do your thing, whatever, during the day, maybe in between work. And then at night you would go to the evening spa. And that was a whole different other thing as well, but it was celebrated over there. So the cultures were, you know, very um, amazing to me. And I just loved it so much because in a lot of those uh, places, unlike the United States, um, being gay was, it was just a celebration. And I think that was what I really enjoyed about being in different countries at that time uh, was it was a celebration, you know, uh, more so now it's more of a celebration than it was back then in the eighties because I think of AIDS and, you know, everything like that. Yeah, you mentioned the um, Atlantic beach in San Juan and um, Atlantic Beach Hotel. And the first time I went to yes. San Juan, I was on a trip that was sponsored by the Puerto Rico Tourism Company, which right. is like their travel bureau. Yeah. And um, they put us up in a hotel on Condado Beach uh, called, it was the Sheridan, Condado, uh, not Sheridan, Marriott Condado. Which Marriott Condado, that's right. It had the Stellaris Casino downstairs. And it was not a gay trip. It was a trip that I was doing for a publication, uh, a mainstream publication. And I was a little nervous yeah. because I knew that Puerto Rico is a little bit of a, um, you know, macho image of males and that there was not likely to be as a much openness for, um, you know, the gay community. And I was hoping to at least be able to visit a gay bar while I was there and kind of experience it. And the irony of it was that one night I decided to go from the Marriott and walk down the beach. So I walked between, you know, the side of the Marriott down the sand toward the beach. And there were these big sea turtles there roped off because it was, you know, May and they were in breeding season. And I walked past there and turned uh, to the left to walk along the beach at night. And the very next building to the Marriott was the Atlantic Beach. And I didn't know it was a gay bar. I didn't know what it was. But there were people up on the patio having a good time and there was music. And so I said, I'm going to go up there and have a beer. And so, like you were saying, it was it was kind of unusual that it was in such a, mm -hmm. you know, open public yeah. tourist area yeah. right next to a major hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the, um, the Atlantic Beach bar is uh, permanently closed now. So it's no longer there. Yeah, but um, so you know, obviously, at a young age, you were performing in gay bars. What impact did the gay bar scene have on your process of coming out? How did that impact you? Well, um, you know, I think basically it was the fact that um, I just saw so many people that were just happy. And they were themselves and it was um, their energy and that they just didn't care what the world, you know, thought about them when they were in that particular, you know, atmosphere. And, you know, I just, um, I, you know, I mean, I have always, always just thought to myself, you know, 
life is just way too short to be able to hide who it is that you really are. You know, I'm not religious, but I'm a very spiritual person. And I believe that in a lot of cases, God put gay people on there on the earth to be able to teach the world about diversity, you know, and being able to, you know, um, you know, make people understand that everybody is different in every way, rather it's sexuality, the color of the skin, you know, type of person that they are, personalities, you know, on and on and on. It's all about diversity. And as the world gets older and older and older, um, I do believe that diversity is going to basically kind of, um, people are just going to really um, just embrace it and enjoy it. And in a lot of cases, maybe, you know, celebrate it. And I think that's what's happening now more so than a lot of different places. Yeah. I mean, we, we are seeing some things with race and all that stuff, but I really think that things, you know, in a lot of cases have to get worse before they get better, you know? Um, but back to your question regarding the impact, I think it just was the fact that I just loved the way that people just accepted the fact that they were um, and how much more happier they, wa they were. Because I did see people when I was out of the bars that I knew for a fact. I mean, th these were people that I would go into high school with. They were like totally gay, you know, but yet they were so denying it. And you could tell by just their, their, their essence and how they were that they just were not happy. They weren't happy because they just had this little secret inside them that were just eating away at them because of what society has fed them, you know, in their brains. And they decided to take this little, you know, thing and take it on as a belief. And it completely destroyed, you know, so many people, you know. And I just thought, you know what, I'm not gonna be one of those people. You know, I'm gonna. I'm going to celebrate my gayness. I'm going to celebrate the, the gift that God gave me, you know? Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of, you know, the, the impact it had on me. Yeah. And obviously it was, it was a positive thing for your career too, because you got to start performing publicly um, with gay bars and things like that before you may have been able to get into some really, you know, mainstream venues um, and kind of hone your talent and everything. You performed um, also at an iconic bar in Los Angeles. I think everybody who um, reminisces about the old days in, in LA has at some point mentioned Studio One. Um, Studio One. And that must have been an incredible experience for someone coming from Tucson and having that smaller town image in their head and then going to somewhere like Studio One, what was that like for you? Oh, when I tell you, Art, it was it was such a dream because I always I always heard of Studio One and all of the celebrities that used to perform there because you know they had that place downstairs from it. Oh God, and you know I can't remember the name of it. It the Rose Tattoo, I think, is yeah. what it was called. Uh, yes. Um, and oh my God, I mean, Waylon Flowers performed there, uh, Jim Bailey performed there. Um, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of great celebrities performed there. And I just, I dreamt as a child, you know, when I was a kid, I thought, oh my God, I mean, I could see myself, you know, being able to uh, perform, you know, at these uh, places. Now, to kind of back up a little bit. Um, so I graduated from high school when I was 17 years old. I graduated when I was a junior, just because I wanted to be able to finish my education in high school. I wanted to get my diploma. And then I had things I had to do in the world. I wanted to become a star, you know. Um, so I basically graduated when I was a junior. I left Tucson. I, I le actually left Tucson, um, you know, a star because, you know, I was very well known there as a, you know, female in person, 
really a celebrity impersonator. I wasn't a drag queen, um, although I, it's funny. I It was my only time that I did have a drag name. My drag name was Miss Edie. That was my very first drag name. That was what you know, all the drag queens decided that they were going to call me Miss Edie. So that was kind of like my very first uh, drag name. Uh, I, I didn't bring it with me. I just thought I just wanted to just go with Eddie Edwards. That was what I had for my entire career. But anyway, so I moved, I graduated, I moved to LA. Um, my, my uncle was the announcer on the Sonny and Cher show. He was very con connected. He was the one who said, ladies and gentlemen, Sonny and Cher. That was my Uncle Jack. And he basically got me into uh, the industry um, working uh, as a script boy. I was, um, I was uh, uh, running scripts um, off, um, printing them up for all of the famous you know, uh, thing, um, series that were going on, like Fame, Little House on the Prairie, uh, Who's the Boss, you know, you know, all that stuff, whatever. So I was doing that during the day. And then at night, I would go and I would venture out to the gay bars. And, you know, I would, you know, try to figure out, you know, how I could be able to crack this nut, you know, because no one knew me. I, you know, I, uh, so anyways, um, so what happened was, um, Around the time that Down and Out in Beverly Hills um, uh, was, uh, was very big, uh, they were having a Bette Midler lookalike contest. And Scott Forbes, the owner, put this whole thing together. Scott Forbes was amazing, amazing guy. Um, and um, he basically um, had known that I did bet. And he said, we're having a Bette Midler lookalike contest. And... Um, we, uh, I would like for you to be able to enter it because I think you have a really good chance of winning. Um, it was hosted by the very famous uh, female impersonator, Kenny Sasha. Now, Kenny was the Bette Midler impersonator of that particular era. There was no one who looked more like Bette Midler than he did at that particular time. Plus, he also traveled with Cher on the road doing Bette Midler. There's a lot of videos of him out there singing with um, Cher as Bette Midler when uh, they were in Las Vegas. Anyway, so Kenny hosted the show. Long story short, I won the grand prize. I think it was $1,000, I think, um, at that time. And that was kind of when uh, people started to you know, talk about me and all this stuff. So there's this amazing Bette Midler, all that stuff. And then that kind of is what got me into the actual um, circuit uh, in California at that time, which was like, um, uh, um, it was Rage uh, was the, the one of the big ones. Um, the Four Star Saloon, I did hundreds of shows at the Four Star Saloon with Erica Townsend, which was the, um, the main diva uh, at that time. Um, and uh, she hosted the show. So I worked there, you know, a lot. And then at that particular time, they had every, every like, I think every, every, every other Sunday, they would have Lacage night. That was when the famous Lacage girls from the, the, the main Lacage uh, nightclub, the one that cre created it all here in the United States was just literally four minutes down the road. Um, and that was where all of the celebrities would go to see famous drag queens. And I thought to myself, I'll never work there ever, but I just would always, I'd go there, I'd hang out, you know, I'd, you know, mingle with the cast, all that stuff, whatever. Well, anyways, I got really good in with the cast of that per, uh, particular, um, the show, the, 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 the main show. That was way before the Broadway musical um, and all that. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going on a tangent. I don't wanna get ahead of myself, but long, long, long story short, um, I went and I auditioned for Lacage and after, so get this, I was hired as Bette Midler the very first day. That's how popular my Bet Bet Midler was. I was hired immediately uh, for for that, um, but 
the guy, the owner, Lou, Lou Pasioko, who was Mr. Lakaja Fall, he was the one that actually cre created Lakage. He said, you know, he said, if I'm going to hire you on a regular basis, he says, you can't just do one character. You've got to do two characters. Everybody had to do at least two, two characters. So I said, well, I said, I do Barbara Streisand. Um, he says, well, how good is it? I said, well, I'll audition for it for you. Um, so I auditioned it. He said, this is the most pathetic thing I've ever seen in my life. He says, um, work on it and come back. I worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. I even went as far as hiring professional makeup artists to kind of help me make up or whatever. Long story short, after 16, 16 auditions, I finally got hired as Barbara Streisand and Bette Midler for Lacage. And then, you know, the, the rest is history. It's amazing. So, so far, most of what we've talked about of your coming out experience and your, your performing experience in the early years has been pretty positive and uplifting. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to leave our viewers or listeners with the wrong impression. Um, you were bullied and shunned for being gay at some point as well, correct? Oh, God, yes. So much. I mean, in high school, because Tucson, Arizona back then was basically like the South, you know. Um, I remember, you know, um, when I was, um, I, I, was, I, was I was bullied in high school so much. It was so funny because my brother had to go through the exact same thing because we were so identical, people couldn't tell us apart. So, you know, I remember this one time, you know, when I first came out of the closet and all this stuff, one of the, um, the big jocks, he was the quarterback or whatever, one of the big um, guys who was really popular. He was like, hey, dude, he was like, I heard you were, I, I heard your brother was gay. Is that true? I said, no, no, no that's not true. I said, I'm the one that's gay. He goes, Fucking faggot! And he just went and just welled on me, you know. Um, and um, you know, and so you know, I um, you know, I I put up with that, you know. But you know, I just figured, you know, if I was, if this was what I had to go through to accept who it was that um, that I was, so be it. I mean, there was nothing I could do about it, you know. I mean, it was their their insecurities, not mine. So anyway, so I took a lot from this particular guy, plus other people, you know, as well. And then, you know, um, in Tucson, anytime, you know, I was out shopping or anything like that. And I'd be, you know, like in a store or whatever. And there'd be like, you know, a young, a young kid probably who was struggling with his own sexuality, you know, um, um, you know, I, you know, they would always tease me or, you know, different things out there. They, you know, would ask me, are you, are you gay? You know, all that stuff. And so anyways, but yes, I did, I did take a lot, a lot of abuse. You know, I think a, a lot of us have, you know, at that particular time and, and really still, still do. I mean, it, it's still, it's still ha happening to these days. But as I'd said before, earlier um, in the video, to this day, I get so many emails from people that I went to high school with who basically said that I was an ins inspiration to them because they, it, it really gave me, them um, a chance to look at me and kind of envy me because I was able to come out of the closet, um, you know, and they weren't. Well, so about five years later, you know, um, when I was kind of starting to get a name for myself, you know, I was really big in the LA area. Uh, I think I've maybe done a couple TV things and all that stuff. I was asked to go back to Tucson, Arizona and perform in a club called IBTs. Um, and, um, you know, I, I believe it's still there. I think it's, 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 it's still there. Um, they had drag shows and, and it was great because I came back to my hometown. It was kind of like the Rose, you know, coming back to her hometown and doing a, a concert. And, you know, I was, you know, uh, that was me, you know, and um, people just, you know, really looked up to me and all this stuff. Well, I walk in um, that particular night to do uh, my show and all this stuff. And who is sitting at the bar? 
French kissing this guy was that jock who literally welled on me when I was young and would tease me and who would beat me up. It was, that was him sitting at that bar. And I thought to myself at that point, you know what? It all makes sense. He just unfortunately saw a little bit of me in him and he just unfortunately couldn't you know, hand, handle it. Did I go up and did I approach him? No, I didn't because that would have been a judgment on my, uh, you know, my, my, you know, with me having to, you know, judge them. And what's, what's the use to that? That's a waste of time and energy. I figured, you know what, he had his journey that he had to take. And if I, you know, had to take a couple punches to be able to have him accept his reality and who it was that he was, so, so be it. Listen, my life is amazing, amazing today. And I wouldn't do anything different. Now I've noticed that during our conversation, um, the name of Bette Midler has come up several times in several different contexts. And she is apparently one of the primary characters that you have been impersonating for decades. Um, it's widely known that Bette Midler got her start in some uh, gay, excuse me, gay uh, bathhouses and CD dive bars. Yes. What was the response to your impersonation of her and your act in general in those same kind of places? Well, it's funny because once I got the name of doing Bette Midler, and there wasn't many people besides Kenny Sasha who actually was doing that, you know, the same time that, you know, I was. Um, and so I was asked a lot by a lot of gay bathhouse owners if I would come and basically, you know, host shows or kind of do a reenactment of her actual, um, you know, bathhouse, you know, um, you know, um, extravaganza that she did when she was with Barry Manilow in the New York, um, you know, bathhouses. And so, um, I really, you know, made some really good money doing that. And it was amazing for me because, you know, Bette Midler always talked about, you know, uh, having all the boys in towels, you know, surrounded by her around the stage, all that stuff and, you know, singing and, and all that stuff and everything. And I, I, of course, you know, did a lot of her older hits, um, you know, anything that was on recording uh, that I was able to, you know, duplicate, you know, or sing to or whatever back then was what I did. And of course, also, you know, um, I also, you know, talked as her live and I did all the jokes, you know, and Sophie Tucker, I'll never forget it, you know, you know, all that, you know, campy stuff and all that stuff, you know, and, and I, you know, just basically uh, um, got as much of her stuff that I could get. Now you have to realize this is way before YouTube. So none of that was available, but I was lucky enough to be able to have friends in the business who had like beta tapes or uh, old videotapes that they had converted um, into, you know, and I was able to see a lot of the stuff that she did when she was in the actual bathhouse. So I was able to create all that. And for a lot of these, you know, people that were at these bathhouses and all that stuff it was amazing for them because they had never seen any of this stuff and they really thought that this was my own material that I was doing a as a Bette Midler character but it wasn't it was all of her stuff I just happened to have been copying it um and doing it and it was amazing. I also went as far as getting a Barry Manilow uh, look-alike. He didn't play the piano, but we kind of made a, you know, little cardboard cut out of a piano, you know, and all that stuff. And he was in the background and all this stuff playing and different things that he did a couple Barry Manilow's numbers and all this stuff. But it was, it was really great. It was re really great. It was a, a lot of fun. People enjoyed it, you know, and... Um, it was, it was really, really fun, fun, fun times. It was wonderful to be able to perform at the famous Hollywood Spa in uh, California, which is like, my God, world renowned 
um, he'd been there, it's been there forever. And there, I remember there was this one guy who was the DJ there. His name was Wizard. Now, you have to be really old to remember Wizard, but he was one of the, he was a bald guy. He was one of the best DJs of all time. And he always played the music there. And he was the one who did my sound, you know, but that's, that's how far, that's how far I go back. And you, you have to realize when I was performing at this club, I was like totally un, underage, um, like I was with all of the rest of the bars. But they didn't care because, you know, um, I looked older. I don't even think anyone really asked my age. They had just figured that I had to have been, you know, over because when I dressed as Bette Midler, I just looked older, you know. So that's that's kind of the story of that. Um, since then, you've become famous for portraying a wide variety of world-renowned celebrities. And one thing I want to emphasize for people who may not know this, you know, we're talking about your impersonations, but all of your impersonations include your live vocals. You're That's not right. lip syncing to anything ever. You, you do characters, voices, mm -hmm. mannerisms, makeup, costume, everything, and impersonate them in the truest sense of the art. Uh, which of those people have you met and you know, what stories would you want to share about that? Sure. Um, well, I have been so blessed in this business. I mean, I thank God every day because I could have, I could have never in my life dreamt of the celebrities that I have met, um, have had dinner with, have been invited over to their beautiful homes, um, have gone places with them, you know, it's, it's just, it's incredible. I have to pinch myself sometimes because I think, is this, is this not a dream? And of course, in my spirituality, this whole event that we're going through, it's all a dream, but, um, you know, it, it's just amazing, you know? Um, so, um, I have, um, met, um, the people that I, let's start with the people that I perform uh, perform as and have met. Uh, first one that I was able to meet was Lily Tomlin. Uh, Lily used to come into the club, uh, the famous club in uh, Los Angeles, La Caja Fall, the original La Caja Fall. Um, and she was the very first one that I was able to uh, perform as. Now, when I was a child, this is how my voices started is that, you know, my brother and I would sit in front of the TV set and we would basically uh, pick up voices. That's how we learned to do voices, was being able to hear them and then do them. Lily Tomlin was my very first character that I ever did live. You know, Ernestine Tomlin, <laughs> one ringy dingy, you know. And so that's kind of what I, that was the very first one that I did. It was ironic that I happened to have been the very first celebrity, it happened to be the very first celebrity that I actually performed for. So the way the story goes is that I was doing, I was doing Bette Midler and Barbara Streisand at the time um, uh, in Lacage, and the owner, Lou Pastioco, had uh, called me and said, Lily and her partner, Jane, just made reservations uh, to come to the show in a week. Could you get your wig, costume, all that stuff together and an act together to do for her when she arrives. And I was like, absolutely. Now, honestly, I'd never did Lily before, except for, you know, when I was a child, all this stuff, I never did the look. So I rushed down to Hollywood Wigs, which was like the place where all of the, you know, famous celebrities would have um, would buy their wigs. Ellen was the owner and she was the best hair stylist. She could do anything. And I said, Ellen, I said, Lily's coming to see me. I said, I need this wig in two days. And so she had the wig for me. Um, I went to a Salvation Army and I got, you know, a blouse and a skirt, a black belt. And I had a friend of mine who worked for the, um, 
the uh, uh, I think it was AT and T or 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 Bell or whatever it was at that time, whatever. And I said, "Do you know? Do you know where I could find like one of those, those old?" operator things that Lily Tomlin used to use for Ernestine. He says, yeah, he says, we have a ton of them. He says, do you, do you? I said, yes, I said, I need one. So he got me one, which was amazing, which made it that much more authentic. And so I, um, I put it together in a week and I was nervous as hell. But when I came out and did it, Lily and Jane were in hysterics. I mean, they just loved it. She had said that she had never seen anyone do her, before, you know, that particular thing. So I guess, I guess I was the first, which was amazing. And she was like, it was, it was amazing. She said, you had every nuisance, new nuisance of me. She said, everything was just absolutely perfect. So of course she loved it. There's a photo of me, I think that you have with me doing Ernestine, dressed up as Ernestine with her the night that I actually did it. So that was the first one. Um, and then, um, this, uh, and then, you know, as time went on, um, trying to think who, who else it was, there was anyone else at Lacage that actually came in to see me perform. Um, I can't, I can't remember offhand. There was so, we got so many of the big celebrities in Lacage that would come see us. Lucille Ball, Frank Sinatra, Johnny Carson. Um, you know, all kinds of different ones. So, I mean, I was performing for all of these amazing celebrities, Donald O'Connor, Ginger Rogers, uh, um, uh, Martha Ray. I mean, you know, all the great ones. If they was, were an old star or even new star, they were always coming into to Lacage to see themselves impersonated. So um, then what happened was, um, so Bette Midler, um, was performing um, at um, in Vegas. Um, this was before her residency, I believe. And so she was performing at Caesars. And so I had a friend of mine, uh, Scott Schechter, who was the entertainment director. He had just seen my show in Vegas. And he had said, uh, why don't you come see Bette Miller, she, you know, she's doing a show, you know, um, at Caesars. And she says, I really want you to meet her because I've shown photos of you to her. And she was in hysterics. So, um, so Scott got me front row seats, you know, and I was able to um, go backstage, spend some time with her, meet her. Um, and just, it was, it was just, I mean, amazing. We had some really amazing quality time together and, um, she was just so complimentary, you know, about me. And she kept on saying to me, it was so funny. She was like, you don't look like a female impersonator. She says, I can't believe you're a female impersonator. You just don't look like a female impersonator. She kept on going on and on and on. And I'm like, what does a female impersonator supposed to look like? She says, I just, I don't know. She says, I'm looking at you. And she says, I just, she says, what you do with makeup and all this stuff is so amazing because you just don't look anything like me now. But she says, when you get dressed up, you just look so much like me. You just don't look like a female impersonator. So she kept on saying that it was just so, so weird. But anyways, um, so um, that was, that was the, the, the next one I met. We always, we always kept in contact with her. I went to go see her on Broadway when she was in Dolly and I got backstage. I had her sign a, a bunch of stuff for me. She, I have a, this Dolores DeLago doll that she signed for me, a bunch of other stuff, program of Hello Dolly. Then, um, then the next one that I was able to meet was Cher. Now, I had met Cher before several times because I was on the set of the Sonny and Cher show. And my brother and I would hang out all the time when we were little uh, because he was the announcer. My uncle was the announcer and also was the secretary to George Slaughter, who was the uh, producer, writer, director of the Sonny and Cher show and laughing and all kinds of different stuff. So, um, you know, so uh, um, met her again. Um, hadn't seen her in a long, long time. And when I told her who I was, she was like, oh my God. She said, I knew you when you were little. She said, you and your brother were so adorable. And she said, Sonny and I, we just, just loved you guys and all this stuff. So that was, that was really nice, you know? Um, and then, um, and then later on, uh, to keep on the, um, the thing for share later on, 
just last October, um, she was doing um, a big thing for Biden and uh, Harris, um, uh, you know, to get them into office and all that stuff. And so she called, um, her people called uh, my friend Frank Marino to host the show and Frank didn't want to do it. So Frank had said, you know, I have Eddie Edwards that could host it. And she was like, oh yes, get Eddie. So anyways, um, so I worked with her. I don't know if I sent you that photo. I worked with her during COVID. This was amazing, during COVID. And I have photos of her and I uh, together. I'm, I'm in the mask, she wasn't, you know. Um, and so I just did something with her and I, it was great because I'd never actually worked with her in an actual show. So to be able to work with her in an actual show and be able to introduce her was a dream come true for me. So to be able to work with an actual um, artist that you actually perform for was amazing because the only one who really did that as far as I know, uh, who actually worked with her on stage uh, while she was doing the show was uh, the best share impersonator of all time in the 80s was um, Elgin Kenna. Not taking anything away from Chad Michaels. Chad Michaels is great. Uh, Chad Michaels is amazing, but Chad Michaels does share now uh, where um, 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 uh, Elgin did share with the 80s look, which is the same thing that uh, that uh, I did. So it was just really a, a great honor to be able to work with her. Then after that, um, then um, I was able, I, um, I met Barbara Streisand uh, when I was at a party. I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't dressed as her at that time, but um, I met her. She knew who I was and she knew exactly what it was that I did. As a matter of fact, her manager, Richard J. Alexander, um, had talked to me and said, you know, Barbara and I were thinking about hiring you to be her decoy when she travels to Europe um, because the, with, all, with all the press, she wanted to hire you to leave after the show and therefore everyone would follow you thinking that it was Barbara and then Barbara could sneak out and have her, you know, privacy. So I was like amazed that she would even consider me, you know, for doing that, but Barbara's the most amazing, amazing woman. She's so nice and really amazing. And then, um, let's see here. Oh, so I had um, I I worked for one of um, the top um, promoters in Montreal, Canada, Sheldon Kagan, who was uh, very famous there, and he knew uh, the gentleman that actually got Celine started, who actually, I believe, introduced uh, Renee to Celine. And so um, he came to see my show when I was in Montreal at Place des Arts um, and had said, you have to meet Celine. I mean, Celine would go crazy. So, um, so he sent video of me doing Celine and Celine says, I, I want to meet this guy. Um, so um, she had me come to Vegas when she was at Caesars. Um, I spent an hour or so w with her and um, we had a great chat and it was amazing because she hadn't seen my website. So I gave her my website um, and um, saw her in the show and it was so funny. So I'm sitting front row and I'm taking notes or whatever. And Celine is playing with me on stage as she's doing her show. So she's like singing. And then all of a sudden she stops and she'll go, did you get that? <laughs> and I'm like dying. And people are like wondering like, what's, what's going on? But she's playing with, and then she would go and she'd sing something. And then she'd go like, are you taking your notes, you know? So it was like um, amazing. She's such a funny, funny woman. She's just, no one knows how funny she is. She's just so funny and so, so crazy. Anyways, after, after the show, the next day, I get a phone call from Patrick, her son, which is uh, Renee's um, son. And uh, Patrick says, Celine wanted you to know that she went to your website. And she said to tell you and your brother, without a doubt, she is your biggest fan. 
So I thought, oh my God, if I could impress Celine with my Celine, I'm like, oh my God, this is like, you know, amazing. So that's my Celine experience. That concludes part one of our Gay Archives interview with the one and only Eddie Edwards. Please stay tuned for part two, where we explore more of his history in Las Vegas and traveling around the country and some more fabulous stories. You can find more information about this podcast and other podcasts at gaybarchives.com slash podcast. Enjoy your trip down memory lane.